Today in series of Docplex scale interviews, we have with us Dr. Amrish Mittal, who is the chairman and head of endocrinology and diabetes division of Medanta, the multi-speciality hospital in Gurgaon. Dr. Mittal is currently the president of the Endocrine and Diabetes Foundation and has special interest in diabetes and heart diseases and evaluation of new therapies for diabetes. He has been honored with the prestigious Padma Bhushan Award in 2015. Thank you, doctor, for this interview. Uh, so let me begin with the first question. What is your opinion about the efficacy and safety of SGL2 and GLPI RAS for treatment of type 2 diabetes patients? So I think you're talking of the most important advances in diabetes care right. in the last few years. And both these groups of molecules are actually quite remarkable in mm -hmm. some way. So when we talk of SGL2 inhibitors, these are orally given molecules that help lower blood sugar by throwing out glucose through the urine. So actually there is excretion of glucose through the urine and that's how blood glucose is lowered. As a concept, it may seem a little unusual, but that's how it is and they seem to work really well. How, what do I mean by that? Not only do they lower blood glucose substantially, they also help in reducing the risk of heart disease. And now, also possibly reduce the progression of renal disease and diabetes. Okay. I'll explain that more. Mm -hmm. So SGL2 inhibitors lower blood glucose without any risk of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, as well as they promote weight loss. So one of the challenges in diabetes is reducing blood glucose, but doing it without producing a marked drop in blood glucose. So lowering glucose without hypoglycemia and with the added benefit of weight loss. And as I said, the long-term benefits of possibly reducing cardiac events, reducing cardiac deaths, in particular, reducing cardiac failure. Heart failure is a common complication seen in, in, in type 2 diabetes. Reduction in heart failure is one of the consistent benefits observed with these new molecules. Data when analyzed carefully, looking at kidney outcomes. See, when you talk of diabetes, you're always worried about long-term count. One is good control right now, prevention of acute events. The other thing is also long-term complications. So prevent, treating diabetes is a little bit like buying insurance. You know, you're, you're, if you treat diabetes well today, it will actually prevent a lot of things later on in life. So if a drug can help prevent two of the most important sinister and potentially lethal complications of diabetes, that is heart disease and kidney disease, that's a huge advantage. And therefore, these molecules in general have been found to, to reduce the risk of the cardiac condition I talked about and more recently to reduce the albumin excretion through the urine, prevent progression of albuminuria, reduce possibly the development of end-stage renal disease. So all these factors put together uh, make them very exciting drugs, uh, new developments in, in type 2 diabetes. So I think uh, SGL2 inhibitors have clearly increased our ability to treat our patients well. Having said that, it's important to remember that every drug can have a downside. So this group of drugs also have to be used with caution in the sense that you can't just prescribe them randomly. The patient should not be very old, should not be having postural hypotension, should not be having already, you know, uh, urinary problems, genital problems. You know, all those things have to be looked at, should be hemodynamically stable. If you've done your homework on those things, if you've excluded patients who could possibly suffer from side effects because of these drugs, if chosen correctly, which a large proportion of our patients will be because they are good candidates for this drug, uh, for, the, for this group of drugs, then you will find out amazing, outstanding results. Yeah. I think uh, this is important. So, no drug is for everyone. Uh, sometimes doctors ask, then this is difficult to choose. 
and I always say, when you go to buy a shirt, when you go to buy a shoe, you will try four or five and then say, this one fits me best. So drugs can't be that simple either. So you have to spend that time with your patient to choose the right patient for the drugs. It sh they should also not be used in people who are potentially type 1 diabetes at present because when you have a high insulin requirement either in type 1 or in type 2 diabetes and you suddenly cut that off, if the patient is not making any endogenous insulin, that also is, can be sometimes dangerous. So if you choose patients carefully, these drugs are a very valuable addition to our armamentarium against diabetes. Oh, so the other group so of new therapies that has really uh, uh, made a mark in managing diabetes is the GLP-1 RAs. The GLP-1 RAs is a group of molecules that work through the incretin concept. Mm -hmm. They are GLP-1-like molecules. GLP-1 is a normal physiological controller of blood glucose in our body, right? So we are mimic mimicking that right. by changing the molecule slightly and prolonging its half-life. So if you, if you were to inject GLP-1 into me, it gets metabolized in, in two minutes, right? If you're going to have a molecule that can evade that metabolic process, evade that DP4 enzyme that chews the GLP-1 up, you will have an action that lasts longer. And that's why this development of molecules derived from the GLP-1 or close to it in some way, which are not chewed up by the enzyme DPP4 has led to the clinical use of GLP-1 receptor agonists. So what's new there? These are again exciting molecules. Why? Because they share some things in common with SGLT2, although they're very different in terms of action. They act by increasing insulin secretion first. And they have a variety of other effects, including effects on glucagon, effects on our stomach, effects on our brain, multiple effects. But the reason, they, uh, the, the, the reason why the end effects seem to be in some ways like SGLT2 is they produce, they don't produce hypoglycemia. So they lower blood glucose without producing significant hypoglycemia, which I think is very important. They promote weight loss. Diabetes is increasing in India because the average weight of Indians is increasing. So if you, drugs like GLP-1 RAs, or like SGLT2 that promote weight loss are very, very welcome. So GLP-1 RA, no hypoglycemia or minimal hypoglycemia and weight loss, right? Now, in addition, interestingly, at least some of them like liraglutide actually also may be protecting the heart. So it's fascinating how newer molecules for diabetes, which are coming in now, don't produce lower sugars at, as was the bane of earlier molecules, don't promote weight gain as was the problem with earlier molecules, and in addition may be helpful for our heart also. So that's the big thing about GLP-1. What is the downside there? They're injectable. Patients hate injections. Although newer GLP-1s may actually turn out to be uh, good and the new oral ones that are being developed, but the ones that are in use right now are injectable either daily but not even weekly. Weekly because that's a huge advance. So you can give a shot on the weekend alone. Right. It's through a pen, very easy to yeah. use, you know, so injectable. And then, you know, patient is fine for the whole week and may be popping his oral pills or her oral pills through the week. So yeah. that's another big advantage. So I think GLP-1 RAs are exciting, but they are injectable and they can produce stomach side effects, gastrointestinal side effects especially upper GI, nausea, vomiting. Typically, these effects are in the first few weeks. And if you hang in there, if you're able to convince your patients to continue the medication, as well as to sort of manage the nausea and the vomiting with concomitant symptomatic therapy, get them through the first few weeks, and you will, uh, you know, the drugs will then stay with the patient. So these are the two big advances. The other advance in asking me about that is in regard to newer basal insulin. Right. So, you know, for a long time, NPH insulin was the only one used. Then along came Glargine and, 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 and Detimir, right. which changed that. Glargine in particular became the gold standard for basal insulin therapy. Basal insulin means insulins that work through the day, maybe almost up to 24 hours. And they mimic 
basal insulin secretion, right? So that is glargine. Now, now uh, over the years, then a new molecule called degludec came in, which is which proved to be as effective as glargine with possibly less hypoglycemia. The main concern of the insulin is hypoglycemia, so possibly less hypoglycemia. So that's that's interesting. And now we have a new version of glargine, which is uh, 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 a concentrated glargine, U300 it's called. So this GLA300 actually, although it is glargine, the molecule is same because it's concentrated and because the surface area exposed after injection is less, it takes a longer time to diffuse. Okay. And because of that, you get a longer duration of action and less variability. And this may also be a very, very useful addition as a once daily stable insulin. Yeah. So we have regular glargine, yeah. we have degludec, and now we have the U300 glargine. Yeah. Uh, so doctor, where does India stand today in case of management and research in diabetes? So I think uh, India actually has been a, a huge contributor to diabetes research. Unlike, you know, people just get up and say anything, <laughs> there is no Indian data. There is lots of Indian data. There is huge amount of Indian data. Thanks to some colleagues, some from the south, some from the north, some from the west. There is a huge amount of Indian data on diabetes. We know the prevalence of diabetes in India through systematic studies. We know how the epidemic is growing in India. The way it has gone up, it is it is impressive in a negative way. But nevertheless, it's, it's actually not impressive is not the right word. It's shocking, actually, the way it's yeah. gone up. From the studies done, by, by my mentor, Professor Ahuja, in the 70s, mm. the, fig, the, the, the prevalence has gone up 20-fold or something now. Yeah. So it's really a disaster that is happening. So something needs to be done, right? right? We're not going today into the causes of why it has happened. Yeah. That's for a separate uh, discussion. Okay. But what can we do about it? So unless we address the root causes, we can't really make much headway. So if I were to look at the diabetes epidemic in India, right. you have to look at it from the prevention or what I call the upstream approaches, right. which means that you're handling the problem at its root. You're preventing diabetes. Mm -hmm. You can prevent diabetes by following nutrition models that have worked all over the world by avoiding obesity in childhood, by good nutrition to mothers during pregnancy, avoiding undernutrition of mothers mm -hmm. in pregnancy. That's another thing and avoiding childhood obesity, right? So the path starts there and then goes on. So healthy food habits and regular physical activity or exercise, which has changed dramatically in India, needs to be put in place. Otherwise, you can't keep treating all diabetes. And even if you treat diabetes, you certainly can't treat the complications of diabetes we talked about. You can't have everyone landing up with kidney failures and heart attacks and manage that. Neither socially nor economically, the, any country will be able to handle that. Yeah. So that is one part. The other part is about greater access to care, which of course is a big challenge in an economically diverse country like ours. And for that, while other efforts are being made, greater use of digital technology, using even cell phones, which are accessible to everyone. People don't have toilets, but they have cell phones, yeah. right? So you can use cell phone technology to access, to help people access care. And I think the use, greater use of technology so that people are not deprived of basic diabetes advice and can be done. So, so first is nutrition and lifestyle related issues to prevent the diabetes epidemic. You know, we shouldn't fuel it further at least, restrict its growth. Those who have diabetes should get proper advice. That can be helped, it's not a one-line answer, it's a huge project. Change, uh, from the physician side also. Yes, so so greater awareness, even greater education of physicians. Yeah. And, but I think that won't be enough. You need to educate society, you need right. to educate paramedical staff yes. in the government system. Only then you'll be able to address these issues. You don't have doctors, that many doctors who address these issues all the time. Okay. And the third, of course, would be the other end of the spectrum, that is better care, actual better care for diabetes including the use of newer molecules that we talked about. And, and that would entail, of course, uh, better access to care, but also using the right molecules that work in your patient. So greater education of, of 
of physicians is the key there. And learning how to choose the correct molecule for your patient. We talked about three molecules yes. and told you how to choose them yes. very briefly, of course, uh, in your patient today. But I think that is very, very important. Now, this thing about Indians being different, it is there, but it's overblown. Because I don't know if any drug that works for Western population doesn't work in India. People say Indian data nahi hai is, is for this medicine, you know. Yes, firstly, human beings are the same. There are differences in Indians. I'm not denying that at all. Higher proportion of body fat, diabetes at lower BMIs, you know, greater visceral fat, lower muscle mass. Certainly, yes. So you need to keep that in mind. But a drug that works there will work here, number one. Number two, most clinical trials now include Indian patients, although probably not in the number that we would want, but they do include Indian patients. That is happening because for, for, for industry, for drug companies, India is also a big market now. So they would look at, you know, getting some hands-on feel with Indian patients too. Where we are lacking is in the stage after that. As doctors, we don't keep our data well enough, and that is because of situations large numbers, you know, different environments we work in. And I think for new molecules that are introduced in India, we should have a means to have proper post-marketing studies. Honestly done post-marketing studies, systematically done post-marketing studies. So even after the drug is licensed, I don't think doing too much phase three in India is going to change anything. What we need to do is good post-marketing in India. So you need to have a new molecule comes into India today. So it should be mapped properly. It should be mapped. Well, okay, we are following up the first thousand patients on this one. Just the first thousand prescriptions on this molecule, and we're going to follow them up. Or first 500. It depends on you know how you power the study. You can look at that. Some may require even more, but it is not so hard, and it is not that expensive to do that systematically. So that we know out of the 1,000 patients who got SGLT2 or got GLP-1, what happened to them? How many responded? How many did not respond? Is it the same as in clinical trial? Is it different? I think that's our responsibility. So we need to plug that gap there. So that's how we can improve care of our patients with diabetes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor, for the interview. It was a pleasure having you here.